Welcome to a CMIA Fireside Chat. Tonight we're with Dr. Matt Kane. We're talking about OSINT and artificial intelligence. This is part one. OSINT, like any function of the intelligence, or any part of the intelligence function, OSINT is a singular aspect for collecting information. I think there's two aspects that I kind of want to touch on here is one, privacy, and how we need to be concerned about our own digital privacy, and to using that information for the greater good. So Matt, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to talk about OSINT and a little bit of artificial intelligence. And, and just to let you know up front, um, I'm using artificial intelligence tonight. So my camera, it might be a look, look a little, little weird. I'm actually not looking at the camera, but my eyes look like I'm looking at the camera. So that's this is a new artificial intelligence engine that NVIDIA has put out to uh, make it look uh, like I'm looking at the camera, even though I'm not looking at the camera. I'm looking at my screen. <laughs> that's pretty cool, isn't it? And, is very- and the other thing is I don't look this good. Like I have a little bit, I have a few more wrinkles and uh, other things, and the camera is uh, using some artificial intelligence to make me look a little bit better than I actually look. So... Uh, you know, I, I, maybe there's some good stuff when it comes to artificial intelligence. So, uh, yeah, we're going to start off tonight by talking about OSINT. And I, I kind of want to talk about the left and the right arc of OSINT and and how you see it. And so that's my first question to you in terms of, you know, a lot of us think OSINT is uh, just, um, you know, a compilation of information written by journalists and uh, and then, you know, we we take that and re-digest it and, and push it out as open source intelligence. So uh, how do you see OSINT and what does it mean to you? Oh, my goodness. That is a large, complicated question. <laughs> it is, isn't it? OSINT, like any function of the intelligence or any part of the intelligence function, OSINT is a singular aspect for collecting information. And here we see... So, so, and how it's advanced in the last year, especially with the war in Ukraine, has amazed me. <clears throat> so, to to start that, it's really any non classified information. We can get that from the internet. We can get that from dumpster diving. I have a friend from the intelligence community who who worked in a provincial intelligence unit and would would do that. Uh, to get information. And he's now a prominent constitutional lawyer, which I think is kind of funny, but it's any type of information we can get. And the amount of information we can get now from the internet that's there is phenomenal. When I did, I helped develop some OSINT training for the CAF in 09. The capability, well, it was one, the wild west back then. There were no regulations about what we could or couldn't do with OSINT. We could just do whatever we could do. And I think that is a little scary in and of itself. There needs to be some constraints in terms of ROEs for any organization, whether that's a government organization or a private sector organization on how you collect and use that information. But going from there, you know, Back in 08, smartphones were just, you know, they were Blackberries. Everyone had their Blackberry at the time. And it wasn't, the web browser wasn't what it is today. The connectivity to the internet isn't what it is today. The iPhone 3 had just come out. We're able to collect so much more information now. And people, I think there's two aspects that I kind of want to touch on here is one, privacy, and how we need to be concerned about our own digital privacy, and two, using that information for the greater good. And one is we need to to be cautious of so many aspects. You know, I turn my Wi-Fi off whenever I go out of the house because if somebody knows how to, they can track you through where your Wi-Fi is paying off of routers. So there's that aspect. And I know I'm getting a little bit off track here, David, so I apologize. That's okay. um, 
left and right arcs, it's it's hard to define, you know, anything hard because it's going to be organizational dependent. And I think for me as an OSINT trainer, I look at the full spectrum. I look at everything. I, I shouldn't say that. I don't go into dumpster diving. I look at everything from a technical digital perspective. Right. From, you know, the open web or the deep web and the dark web and how those can all be utilized, but also the negative drawbacks of using, especially the dark web and tours and all those aspects. So it's, um, it's really, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to compile what I want to say here. And I, well, let, let me help you out with that. Like, yeah. so, you know, like I, on the left-hand side of it, you know, we got the journalists who are compiling yeah. articles. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, you know, there's uh, like investigative uh, OSINT, right? Yeah. Um, where you can dive deep into a person's life, whether they want to have that revealed or not. Uh, I guess, you know, like when I take a look at uh, uh some of the OSINT techniques in terms of like buying information uh, that includes username and password. Sometimes that includes an email address and then using that information, aggregating it together to be able to break passwords so that you can then um, get into a person's private information uh, relatively simply, honestly. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, like I, I have a root password that I've been using since like 1992 and I just use variations of it. If somebody knew that root part of the root password, they could probably figure out all the uh, derivatives because I use that one phrase uh, as you know a single character and then modify it. Um, once you had that one phrase, it wouldn't be hard to uh, start you know uh, yeah. just using brute force to find all the other parts. So I'm positive that, you know, like that particular phrase is out there and associated with my email address in some of the uh, the spills that have been out there. And it's it's easy to buy those like they're 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 not even that expensive. You download them onto your computer and then you can have terabytes of uh, usernames and passwords for, you know, anyone in the world, honestly, and uh, and then start going after them if you want to to uh, find out all kinds of information about them. Um, that's pretty scary, isn't it? That is extremely scary. And one of the things with that is that there's about 8 billion people on the planet right now. And there's something like 20 billion instances of personal records or records for 20 billion people out there. So everyone's right. information is out there multiple times. Right. And when we look at that and how inexpensive it is, you can, if you know how to access it, you can get somebody's digital information <coughs> from the dark web for cents, realistically. Mm -hmm. yes. and so it's it's knowing how to do that and how to utilize it that is really the scary part. Yeah, in my, and more and more people are becoming more and more aware of how to do that. I have a. When I did the help develop some OSINT training for the CAF in 09, I had a cousin who was in high school and he was not a good student in any way, shape, or form, but he was better at OSINT than the trainers who had trained me because of his necessities to get around school blockages and how to find workarounds and get deeper data. And this is something that he's used for good or evil uh, throughout his life in the last, what's that, 14 years. And the people who are coming up, you know, the younger generation, they're going to be even better than we are. Like I have to do so much upkeep of my skills and for them, it's almost second nature. And they're going to be the ones, in my opinion, who are going to be there accessing this data 
in a more malignant way than we've seen before because it's so much more available to them from their perception of it. Whereas right. for lots of people, journalists, for example, getting to the dark web and doing this is ethically questionable. Right. So, and I think those ethics are going to change because the perception around digital privacy is going to change. Right. Right. So just, I saw uh, a comment there about purchase data and I would, uh, like to just comment on that if I can. So OSINT, there's a lot of OSINT tools that are purchased, you can purchase now to get access to both purchase and open source data. And Multigo is a great example of that with all the APIs that they have that feed into it. Uh, and I think as more people are coming up, we're gonna into the OSINT space, we're gonna see more and more I don't want to say buying power, but people looking to purchase OSINT uh, resources uh, to get that access quicker and more in a more consumable fashion. Right. So I, I guess to go along with that in terms of like the purchase, like on the military side, I mean, we obviously um, we subscribe to various services, sometimes translation services, sometimes uh uh, other organizations that aggregate information, like uh, Jane's, for example, is a great uh, example. We pay them a couple million dollars a year uh, for their subscriptions. That would definitely be on the OSINT side as well, wouldn't it? So, yes. um, yeah. And then, you know, of course, there is things like access to databases. Um, but <laughs> like sometimes those databases are that, like that is stolen information uh, yes. that is yes. being sold uh, inappropriately. Um, to people who can then leverage it for, you know, however they want to in terms of OSINT as well, right? Yes, and that's the the dark side of OSINT. Right, right. And So, sorry, go, go ahead. No, I think maybe, I, I like to frame OSINT more in terms, instead of left and right, in terms of like light and dark, or yeah. And I think that's probably how I would phrase it, just in terms of, yeah, the the ethically right and the ethically wrong aspects of that. So that's a conversation that I've been having a lot with AI and the ethics around that. So I've been thinking a lot about those aspects as well recently. Right. So uh, I think you and I have been talking and you've, you, uh, you purchased um, the 10th edition of Uncovering online information um yeah i i I have my copy on order i should have it a couple days i mean he mike so it's michael uh burley right sorry basil and uh, i mean the techniques he goes into in that book are um yeah most of them are illegal right let's let's be clear about that but Mm -hmm. like in in terms of the level of penetration and uh, investigative powers that uh, he puts into the hands of people that want to follow those techniques. Um, it's amazing what kind of information one could have access to if you use all the techniques he goes into. And he kind of does two parts. He talks about like personal privacy, so shows you how to disappear uh, to the point of even talking about if you want to fake your own death and completely uh, uh, be removed from the planet um, and and restart a new digital ID. And to the other side of, uh, you know, how to find somebody, um, you know, using various uh, techniques and databases um, from facial recognition, because like everybody's face has hit a camera at some point uh, to um, uh, to, you know, buying passwords and and breaking into people's banking and tax information. So uh, what do you think of the book? And uh, like, what what are the highlights for you? So the book is. I'm torn about the book for a lot of the reasons that you said, because a lot of what it is, is that ethically gray to black area for me. Mm -hmm. But there's other aspects with social media 
open source intelligence aspects of it are, are great because that's all publicly available information. Excuse me, people are putting out this information on Twitter, on Instagram for people to see and consume and getting more information from the front end and the back end of that is great. My ish, my biggest issue with the book is that, well, I guess there's two. One, as was pointed out in the comments, it's, it's very US centric. Right. But so many of the tools that are there are applicable across the board, especially when it comes to social media. And the other one is with any book, you know, he's putting out a, a new edition every year right now. And as soon as I got the book, there was aspects that were outdated. Right. Because it takes time to write, edit, publish. So I love the book. And I would say it's probably the main resource for getting into OSINT for any beginner that they should use to start understanding the, the concepts and the tools and the strategies to use. But blogs... It's, it's more than beginners. Like It is the definitive book right, for OSINT right now, is it? Would yes. you, wouldn't yes. you say? So I it's also say. for the most advanced OSINT uh, users out there. Like I don't think there's anything more sophisticated than what he has. I would say that there's some really good blogs out there right. uh, that are very complimentary. Not necessarily right. better, but the, mm -hmm. he'll teach you, you know, you can go see the updates on the blogs because right. they're published instantaneously. So yes. those aspects, the, his blog is great for that. There's the OSINTing. Mm -hmm. um, Rito Gill has a good blog. Skip uh, OSINT Dutch Guy uh, is his handle on Twitter. He has a great blog yeah. about this as but well. But he also talks about that book as well and how important it is. He does, yes. <laughs> so... But and his stuff is more European centric versus the mm -hmm. US centric. So you get a good idea of differentiators there. But there's so many good international resources in the book as well. And it is the definitive book right now. I just want to say that it needs to be complemented by other learning, by by blogs. Yes. 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 Absolutely.